Good afternoon. The Secretary General will uh, preview the meeting of NATO Defence Ministers uh, and then he'll have time for some questions. Secretary General. Good afternoon. Tomorrow, NATO Defence Ministers uh, will meet to address the most uh, serious security crisis we have faced in Europe uh, for decades. There are signs from Moscow that uh, diplomacy should continue. This gives grounds for cautious optimism. But so far, we have not seen any sign of de-escalation on the ground. Russia has amassed a fighting force in and around Ukraine, unprecedented since the Cold War. Everything is now in place for a new attack. But Russia still has time to step back from the brink, stop preparing for war, and start working for a peaceful solution. NATO allies have been very uh, clear that any further Russian aggression against Ukraine would come at a high price. We have systematically exposed Russia's actions, plans and disinformation to lay bare to the world what Russia is doing and to make it harder for Russia to conduct aggressive actions. At the same time, <clears throat> NATO allies remain ready to engage with Russia. On the 26th of January, I invited Russia to a series of meetings in the NATO-Russia Council. We sent concrete proposals for a substantive agenda. To listen to the Russian concerns, share ours, and look for common ground. We are ready to discuss NATO-Russia relations, European security, including the situation in and around Ukraine, and risk reduction, transparency, and arms control. But we will not compromise on our core principles. Every nation has the right to choose its own path. And there will never be first-class and second-class members of NATO. We are all NATO allies. We have stepped up the turns and defense across the lines to remove any room for misunderstanding or miscalculation. We have deployed more troops, planes and ships to the eastern part of the lines, increased the readiness of our uh, NATO response force, and boosted uh, our battle groups in the Baltic region. Just last uh, week, I was in Romania to meet additional U.S. troops deploying together with other allies. A strong demonstration of U.S. commitment to the defense of Europe, from the Black Sea to the Baltic. NATO defense ministers will address the need to further increase our defensive posture. And I welcome the offer by France to lead a new NATO bat group in Romania. Tomorrow, I will also chair a regular meeting of the nuclear planning group, ensuring that our nuclear deterrent remains safe, secure, and effective. Defense ministers will meet our colleagues from Ukraine and Georgia to discuss the worsening security situation in the Black Sea region. Our NATO allies will reaffirm our strong support for both countries' sovereignty and territorial integrity. We will also meet with our partners, Finland, Sweden, and the European Union to continue our close consultations and further strengthen NATO-EU cooperation. The current crisis has shown once again how important it is to invest in our defense. So ministers will review burden sharing across the alliance. I welcome that our latest figures show seven consecutive years of increased defence spending across Europe and Canada, with $270 billion extra since 2014. 
and I encourage allies to continue to invest in our shared security. Finally, uh, we will also discuss NATO's next strategic concept, which will be adopted at the Madrid summit in June. I am confident that allies will recommit to our core values and the importance of Europe and North America standing together. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. <coughs> okay. We'll go to Reuters, <coughs> up there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wana. Um, so, so Russia has said it is returning some troops to their to, to bases uh, after military exercises were completed. Um, are you saying then you, this isn't true, or that you're not seeing any kind of change on the ground? Thank you. So far, we have not seen any de-escalation on the ground. Uh, not seen any. Uh, signs of uh, reduced uh, Russian military presence uh, on the borders of Ukraine. Um, but we will continue to monitor and to follow closely what uh, Russia is uh, doing. And uh, um, um, the, 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 the signs coming from Moscow uh, about uh, a willingness to continue to engage in diplomatic efforts, uh, that uh, gives uh, some reason for uh, cautious optimism. Uh, but we will, of course, follow very closely what's uh, happening on the ground uh, and whether uh, this is reflected uh, in some real de-escalation of the Russian military build-up in and around Ukraine. Okay, we'll <coughs> go to NPR. Hi, thank you. Terry Schultz with NPR. Second. Hi. Um, over here. Um, would it really matter if some of the troops are returning to their garrisons? I mean, this is this may not be a sign of de-escalation when you have, you know, more than 100 BTGs and uh, more than 100,000 troops. Um, just to follow up on Robin's question, but additionally, there, um, I, I think uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov said yesterday that Russia had prepared its response to the U.S. and NATO. Have you received any such response? Thank you. No, we have not received any response uh, from uh, Russia uh, yet. Uh, we uh, will welcome a response. Uh, we sent them uh, in January uh, our proposals, uh, quite substantive proposals, in parallel the United States and NATO, where we outlined uh, a wide range of issues, topics, where we are ready to sit down and look for common ground on arms control missiles, um, transparency on military activities and many other uh, areas. Um, and we are ready, uh, we have been ready for a long time and we remain ready to engage in good faith in dialogue with Russia to, uh, to find a political uh, solution. Um, um, of course, what we have seen on the ground, uh, uh, actually since last uh, spring, is that there are moving forces around, but that doesn't represent a real de-escalation. Uh, and we've also seen uh, that sometimes they move into a position uh, with um, uh, combat the troops and a lot of heavy equipment. And then they take out some of, or perhaps even most of the troops, but they leave uh, the equipment uh, behind. And then they can very uh, quickly reinforce and move all the people back, all, all the troops back again if needed. So the movement of forces, the movement of uh, of Russian capabilities doesn't represent real de-escalation. Uh, but we will monitor, we will follow uh, what they are doing, uh, and of course we call on them to uh, de-escalate, uh, to withdraw uh, troops, uh, because the Russian military build-up uh, in and around Ukraine is unprecedented, not only with a high number of combat ready troops, but all the support, all the combat enablers, uh, they need to actually conduct uh, a full-fledged uh, uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine. Um, and with all these forces, all these capabilities in place, Russia can uh, conduct uh, an invasion uh, of Ukraine uh, with uh, very little or hardly uh, any warning time at all. Uh, so uh, we follow this, but at the same time uh, we uh, uh, believe there is uh, uh, some ground for cautious optimism uh, based on the signs coming from Moscow uh, that they are interested in continuing uh, diplomatic uh, efforts and to sit down with NATO and NATO allies to find a political uh, solution. Okay, we'll go to Interfax Ukraine. 
Thank you, Anna. Interfax Ukraine, Irina Sommer. Secretary General, two questions, if I may. Uh, first one, can you please give more details about upcoming meeting with Ukrainian Minister of Defense, in which format it will be, when it will be? What do you expect from Ukrainian side? And second question is, uh, being under a threat of possible war, don't you think that NATO might review Bucharest decision regarding Ukraine, or in other words, maybe it's easier to give up Ukraine. Thank you. I look very much forward to the meeting with uh, the Ukrainian Defense Minister, uh, also uh, together with the Defense Minister of Georgia. Uh, uh, the two defense ministers will meet uh, all 30 NATO defense ministers. This will take place on uh, Thursday, and uh, it is uh, uh, yet another sign of the very uh, close and highly valued partnership we have with Ukraine um, and the strong support uh, that allies provide to Ukraine. Um, uh, in the meeting, I expect <coughs> the ministers to once again express uh, their uh, political support to Ukraine, the, uh, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And as you know, NATO provides uh, support uh, with uh, the capacity building, we help to modernize Ukraine's uh, uh, defense and security institutions. I guess that will be, I expect that to be addressed during the meeting. And, uh, and, um, and we also help with cyber defense. And then, of course, on top of what NATO do together, several NATO allies uh, provide also bilateral support uh, to Ukraine. So uh, the political, the practical uh, support to Ukraine will be addressed in the meeting. Um, then I, I, uh, I, I think also it will be uh, an opportunity for all of us to take stock. Uh, are there any signs uh, that things are moving in the right direction or uh, is the military buildup in and around uh, continue uh, or does it continue? So um, I think it's a bit early to preempt the exact outcome of that discussion, but uh, it is important that when things are so... Um, challenging and when tensions are as high as they are now, it is important that we consult closely with close partners with Ukraine and that's exactly what we do. Let me also add that we are in regular contact with Ukrainian leadership in different formats uh, almost all the time. I've spoken several times with President Zelensky and uh, we continue to be in close contact with uh, the government of Ukraine. We'll go to Frankfurt. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, no. The Bucharest uh, decision stands. Um, NATO strongly believe that uh, all uh, nations uh, have the right to choose their own path, and uh, and the NATO's door uh, remains open. Uh, the enlargement of NATO has been a great success. It that helps to spread democracy, freedom, and ensure peace and stability across Europe for uh, for decades. Uh, so uh, uh, that decision stands. Okay, we'll get to Frankfurt the Allgemeine Zeitung. Yeah, a uh, gentleman over there with glasses. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, Secretary General, um, over the past days, France has indicated that it no longer considers or would no longer consider the NATO Russia founding act uh, valid in case of an invasion. Do you expect a discussion uh, on the NATO Russia founding act in that uh, respect during the defense ministerial? And do you sense um, a change among member states which decided after the 2014 annexation of Crimea that they still be bound by this um, basic act? Thanks a lot. Um, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine will be a blatant violation of the NATO-Russia founding act. Uh, but that has happened before. Uh, but NATO allies are still committed uh, to the uh, founding act. Uh, we uh, believe uh, in uh, the importance of respecting all our international law obligations, including the, the founding act. Uh, and, um, and we have seen before that, uh, that Russia has violated the founding act by invading <coughs> Ukraine, by using military force against Ukraine and illegally annexing uh, Crimea. Uh, but we still I believe uh, in, in the importance of uh, the founding act uh, and, um, and, uh, and I also like to add that, uh, that we strongly also believe in the dual track approach. 
that uh, we need dialogue, we need to talk to Russia, uh, but at the same time uh, we need strength uh, and deterrence and defense, and, and that remains NATO's uh, uh, position. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Associated Press? Lorn Cook from the Associated Press. You spoke before just on the troop movements about the different types of things that Russia's been moving in recent weeks. You spoke about fighter jets, about uh, S-400s and so on. Then more recently about the enablers, uh, about uh, m medical uh, centers, logistics, command and control and so on. Um, when it comes to the things that Russia is talking about withdrawing today, do you, do you see any substance in that, anything significant that might impact its ability uh, to, to invade Ukraine? And if I could also just ask you very briefly, uh, during the last few months, has, has there ever been a, a direct and uh, probable uh, security threat to a NATO ally? So, so far, we have not seen any de-escalation on the ground from the Russian side. Uh, over the last uh, weeks and days, we have seen the opposite, uh, a continued military build-up uh, with more troops, uh, more uh, battle groups, uh, more uh, high-end capabilities, artillery, uh, air defense, um, missiles, and a, a lot of support elements uh, that makes it possible to, for Russia to uh, move into Ukraine uh, for a full-fledged invasion or a more limited military incursion with uh, uh, hardly any warning time uh, at all. That picture has not changed so far, uh, but we monitor, we follow what they do, and, uh, and we believe there is some ground for cautious optimism based on the uh, uh, signals uh, and signs coming from Moscow that they're ready to uh, engage, uh, continue to engage in a diplomatic effort. And we are ready to continue to engage in a diplomatic effort. Uh, so uh, uh, it's too early to say, but uh, since we so strongly believe in the need for a political solution, uh, of course we will now really look into whether there is a, a possibility to, 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 to create a framework for meaningful uh, dialogue with Russia. I welcome the different formats. Uh, we, need, we need a NATO-Russia council, we need the bilateral talks between different NATO allies, we need a Normandy format to engage with Russia, and I also welcome the efforts by many um, NATO allied leaders uh, uh, meeting with uh, President Putin, engaging with Russia. We have Chancellor Olaf Scholz in, Scholz in Moscow today. Uh, last week, uh, President Macron. Uh, also, um, of course, President Biden has uh, been in contact with President Putin. Uh, so has um, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson and others. So, so there are many efforts from NATO and NATO allies to engage with Russia. Um, uh, we we, 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 we um, hope that we will receive a, an, an answer from Russia soon. Um, uh, on uh, an answer to our letter, to our proposals, uh, where we invited them to sit down in a series of meetings uh, and, and outlined the topics we are ready to uh, discuss. Um, then, um, uh, yeah, so in a way, I think that's... So it, it's too early to say whether we can see anything on the ground, uh, but I will tell you, uh, or at least we may... Let's come back to what we tell you when, but at least we are following very closely uh, what they are doing. Okay, lady in red then. Sorry. What we see is a serious uh, build-up in and around Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think also the fact that we have increased the NATO presence um, in the eastern part of the alliance sends a very, uh, a very clear message to any potential adversary that we are there to defend and protect all allies. And I've seen that myself. The battle groups, I, I visited them in... Um, uh, just before Christmas in, in Latvia and, uh, and, uh, and Lithuania, and then uh, on Friday I was in Romania, and, and the fact that we have deployed uh, more NATO troops uh, on the ground, uh, more naval assets, more, more, more uh, aircraft, uh, all of that sends a very clear message. So, so, so we are there uh, to protect and defend all allies, and I think there is no uh, room for any miscalculation in Moscow about our commitment to defending allies. So we have to understand that Ukraine is a partner, we support Ukraine, but for all NATO allies, 
We provide 100% security guarantees, and uh, we have demonstrated that commitment also with more North American presence in Europe over the last weeks. Okay, we'll go to uh, the lady with the red scarf then. Jack from Bloomberg. I just had a follow-up to my colleague's question. Um, could you be a bit more precise about um, what the start of de-escalation would look like? I mean, how many troops would have to pull back? And to what extent um, do you see this uh, Russia's new force posture as a long-term uh, uh, formation there? Thank you. <clears throat> so what you have to see is, of course, a substantial a withdrawal of troops, but not only troops, also equipment. Because what we saw this spring was that they moved in with troops and heavy equipment. And very often it takes much more time to move the heavy equipment than to move in and out uh, the troops and the soldiers. Uh, and uh, 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 what we have seen before um, is that they go in with heavy equipment and troops, take up, out some troops, and then they can easily move them back uh, in again after just a few days, on very short notice. So, so uh, what we need to see is a significant and enduring uh, withdrawal of uh, forces, troops, and not least the heavy equipment. Uh, but I think also we need to understand that what we have seen over, the, the, in reality, the last year, because this actually started last spring and then they have gone up and down uh, 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 with the uh, so upward trend all the time, um, uh, will have a lasting impact on the security situation in the Europe. And that's also why NATO is uh, not only responding to the current crisis in around Ukraine by uh, increasing our presence in the eastern part of the lines, but we are also going to uh, consider more long-term adjustment to our posture in the east. Uh, including uh, 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 with uh, considering the establishment of a battle group, uh, uh, for instance, in Romania, uh, and I welcome the offer by France to, to lead that battle group. So I think you need to distinguish between also di different things. NATO has, since 2014, increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance because of Russia's aggressive actions against Ukraine with the illegal annexation of Crimea. And that has taken place over many years with uh, the battle groups, with the new command structure, with, uh, with more naval and, and, uh, and um, air presence. Uh, uh, but also uh, then uh, in the last um, weeks and months, uh, we responded to the current crisis by uh, increasing our presence. And then we uh, are looking at the more long-term adjustment. Uh, but that will be something we will take decisions on later on. Okay, we'll go to Politico. Thanks very much, David Hersenhorn uh, with Politico. Secretary General, at the start of the Olympics, we saw quite a striking joint statement from Russia and China against NATO expansion. I wonder if you assess that this one outcome of this crisis is stronger unity between Russia and China against the alliance. Would this have happened if leaders hadn't turned to the China issue at uh, last uh, year's summit? I know the strategic concept you said would address Russia more than it had before, and China more than it had before. Does it need to address now Russia and China together? So first of all, NATO has to <coughs> respond to reality. And the reality is that uh, uh, China and Russia has uh, come closer and closer over uh, the last years. Uh, they are exercising together. They are working more closely together in the diplomatic uh, domain in the UN Security Council. But we also see how they conduct more and more exercises. I've done that over the last years, including recently with the joint exercise uh, with Iran in the Indian Ocean. So, of course, these are realities uh, that have taken place over some time and, and, and they impact our security. So there, there is no way we can deny or, in a way, uh, uh, not take that into account. And that's exactly what NATO has done over the last years, um, especially since our summit in um, uh, last summer where we, for the first time, had some substantial language on the security uh, cons consequences of China for our security. But we, uh, we are ready to also engage with, with China. Um, uh, we need dialogue. We need, we need, uh, we need um, to address uh, arms control, uh, big issues like uh, uh, also climate change and many other issues. And that's exactly what we are doing. Uh, but uh, knowing that, uh, for instance, uh, China is now rapidly developing new nuclear 
capabilities, long-range missiles, uh, hypersonic missiles, uh, of course, that matter and missiles that can reach uh, all NATO territory. Uh, there is no way we cannot take that into account. Uh, not, also, not least also because uh, we see that China is coming closer to us in cyberspace, in the Arctic, in Africa, and also trying to, crit, uh, to control critical uh, infrastructure. I think what fundam fundamentally what we see is that two authoritarian powers, Russia and China, are operating together because they don't like a rules-based international order. They don't share our values, freedom, democracy. And that's also the reason why they try to deny sovereign democratic nations the right to choose their own future. They, 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 they want a world where big powers can decide what smaller powers and, and, and countries can, can do. Uh, so this is, this is about fundamental principles, whether free independent countries can choose to be part of a, an alliance as NATO, or they can choose to stay out. We should respect it anyway. And NATO respect sovereign democratic decisions by Finland and Sweden to uh, not apply for membership or by uh, Ukraine to apply for membership. This is their sovereign democratic decisions and we respect them. But Russia and China do not. They, they have stated clearly in a joint statement that they don't want uh, countries in the world to have that freedom to make their own decisions on their own future. And that just demonstrates a fundamental difference when it comes to values and what kind of world we would like to live in. I would like to live in a world where you have free democratic nations living in a world with a world order and where a rule of law is what we have to abide to, not a sphere of influence where big powers decide what neighbors can do. We'll go to Imedi. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Secretary General, uh, what can you tell us about uh, the meeting with Georgian uh, Defense Minister? You spoke about Ukraine, um, uh, and can you tell us more about it? And also, last week during the press conference here in this room, uh, Polish President said that they asked for a high-level meeting uh, with Ukraine and Georgia in Madrid. What do you think about this idea? Thank you so much. So first of all, I look very much forward to the meeting with the Georgian uh, Defence Minister. It, it reflects the, the, the close uh, partnership, the, the important partnership we have with uh, Georgia. We have just uh, um, uh, so, uh, stepped up our uh, cooperation in different uh, uh, ways. We have, we have uh, activities together, we will have um, uh, also an exercise together, and there are other ways of demonstrating how NATO and Georgia are uh, working closely uh, together. Uh, and we continue to provide support to uh, the reform efforts, uh, and we continue to, uh, of course, support the territorial integrity and sovereignty of uh, Georgia. So this is part of the regular, important, close uh, coordination between uh, Georgia and, uh, and uh, NATO, uh, and, uh, and I look forward to, to, to the meeting. Well, well, that's too early to say the different formats of the Madrid Summit, uh, so let's, we have to come back to that. We'll try to take a couple of questions online before coming back <coughs> to, uh, to the press room. Uh, so I'll go to Vege Alpiane Jonsson. Hi, thank you. Uh, Mr. Stockmark, I would like to ask you about the, the unprecedented public sharing of intelligence uh, during this month, specifically from the US and latest uh, about the possible inv uh, invasion tomorrow on Wednesday. Uh, is this open sharing a new tool for NATO or for allied meant for deterrence? And can you tell us whether, in your opinion, if it had had any effect on Russia? We have systematically shared information about the Russian plans, the Russian capabilities, and the Russian attempts to uh, stage a pretext uh, for aggressive actions uh, against uh, Ukraine, uh, what is often referred to as false flag operations. And we do so uh, because we believe in transparency, but also because we believe that that makes it harder for Russia to conduct aggressive actions against Ukraine. So uh, to lay bare uh, everything they do uh, is a way also to um, increase the threshold uh, for them uh, to uh, 
invade uh, uh, Ukraine, to, to send in uh, forces, to try to organize uh, riots, uh, topple the government, or uh, all the other things uh, that we are afraid that Russia may try to uh, do. So, um, so the fact that uh, we do this is a way also to try to counter and to prevent uh, these things from happening. So I think we have to understand that intelligence is, is, uh, is not always a prediction. Intelligence is information. Uh, and when we share information, it is actually an effort to try to prevent uh, things from happening which would have otherwise happened. So, <clears throat> yes, we do this <clears throat> in an attempt to, <clears throat> to prevent um, aggressive actions against uh, Ukraine. Okay, we'll go to DPA, Ella Joyner. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, basically, uh, I'm inferring from your comments that you have no plans to step back from building up uh, NATO's presence in the eastern flank. If you did see uh, a, I think you said a uh, significant and enduring withdrawal, would you then consider reversing those plans to increase NATO's presence in its eastern flank? Thank you very much. So NATO is a defensive alliance. Everything we do is defensive and it's about uh, protecting and defending NATO allies. Second, uh, uh, we have had a, 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 an increased presence of NATO in the eastern part of the alliance uh, since uh, 2014. It started in 2014 because of Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea and because of uh, Russia's uh, um, continued efforts to destabilize uh, Ukraine, including by supporting the separatists in uh, Donbas. So this has been there now for many years and that has uh, triggered the, the, the defensive uh, um, response uh, uh, from NATO in the eastern part of the, uh, the alliance. Um, <clears throat> then, over the last uh, couple of months and weeks, uh, we have seen that some of this presence has been enhanced, boosted, uh, because we have seen a very current uh, uh, challenge in and around Ukraine. Uh, we will assess and we will judge the need to maintain that. It depends on what's happening in and around Ukraine. Uh, but it's f too early, in a way, to speculate, because so far we have not seen any uh, uh, de-escalation by Russia, uh, and we speak about uh, well over 100,000 troops, uh, combat ready troops, uh, uh, also close to, uh, they are close to Ukraine, on the Ukrainian borders, um, but they're also uh, close to NATO territory, uh, not least uh, uh, Poland, uh, some of the Baltic countries uh, bordering uh, uh, Ukraine and of course bordering uh, Belarus. Uh, so we will make judgment decisions based on what Russia actually do. Uh, but I think also that we need to understand that there will most likely be some long-term consequences, uh, some long-term deter deterioration of the security environment uh, in Europe uh, of uh, this significant Russian military build-up, the threatening rhetoric. Uh, so we are also then assessing whether we should have some more longer-term adjustments or presence in the eastern part of the uh, alliance. And we'll take uh, a final question from uh, Zoom, uh, Robert Lupitu from Cale Europena. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, today the Romanian Defense Ministry has announced that uh, Romania has completed uh, the necessary operations to declare the initial uh, operational capability of the NATO battle group. Uh, I want to ask you, how soon can this battle group be up and running? And uh, troops do you expect it to be installed over there? Thank you. I will not preempt any uh, decisions by uh, ministers. Uh, I met with uh, President uh, Klaus Johannes on Friday and we discussed uh, the battle group. I also discussed this with President Macron uh, and I expressed uh, my support uh, and that I welcome the, the French uh, offer to, to lead a battle group in, uh, in um, Romania. Uh, it will take some time before we have uh, all the decisions in uh, place and also some time to have command and control and, and all the other issues that has to be decided before a battle group uh, uh, potentially is, uh, is uh, uh, um, stationed in, uh, in Romania. But then I think it is important to remember 
that while we are uh, working on this issue of a French-led battle group in Romania, it doesn't mean that we do not do anything. So just over the last few days, the United States has added 1,000 uh, troops to their presence in Romania. So that adds to the place, also that's in, uh, to, to, to the thousand they already had. Uh, uh, so, so, so that's just that is 2,000. Uh, United States, I made it clear that, that that's not necessarily a permanent uh, presence, but it is a significant reinforcement of NATO presence in Romania, which is, has already taken place. I saw, you know, the the striker units coming into Romania, coming into Constanza, uh, and, uh, and there are more U.S. planes, there are more uh, German, uh, Italian, uh, and other allies have also stepped up. So I think we have to distinguish bet between the more imminent need for more troops and forces, for instance, in Romania. <clears throat> we have already deployed more troops and forces to Romania, and I welcome the United States and others, um, uh, 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 and then distinguish that or to separate that from the issue of more long-term adjustment, and the question of a battle group is a more long-term adjustment of our presence uh, in uh, Romania and uh, the rest of the eastern part of the alliance. Okay, we'll come back here to <coughs> Ukraine Forum. Uh, Dmitry Skurko, National News Agency of Ukraine here. Uh, Russian rhetoric was accompanied by some quite aggressive decisions by the state Duma, uh, which is uh, uh, support. Uh, suggested to President Putin to recognize the independence of so-called Donetsk and Lugansk republics. I understand it is not a purely NATO issue, but uh, as NATO is going to intensify uh, the negotiations with Russia, how that move would uh, impact them? And the second question, if I may, uh, have you received from Russian side any uh, response to your uh, proposal to uh, conduct uh, and to hold uh, the uh, next NRC meeting. Thank you. To answer the last question first, uh, we have not received any response uh, from Russia on our proposal to both convene a series of uh, meetings in the NATO Russia Council. We had one meeting in January. Uh, it lasted for four hours. It was, what's it say? Uh, uh, challenging, but also very important meeting because we were together there, uh, Russia and all NATO allies, and discussing and addressing uh, Ukraine, uh, the security implications of the um, military build-up by Russia in Ukraine. I think that that in itself uh, was of great importance. But we have not received any response from uh, Russia on our invitation to uh, hold uh, additional meetings of the NATO Russia Council, and we have not received any response from. Russia on our written proposals on the different topic subjects that we are ready to uh, discuss with, uh, with Russia. Uh, we uh, uh, look forward uh, and we welcome a, a response from Russia uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, and let's then uh, see uh, what kind of response we will uh, get. Um, uh, then uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the question of uh, a Russian recognition of uh, uh, the so-called republics, uh, uh, People's Republics of, the, of Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, well, if that happens, that will be a blatant violation of uh, Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty once again. Uh, because there is no doubt that uh, Donetsk and Luhansk is uh, part of Ukraine within international recognized borders. So uh, such a recognition will be a violation of international law and the uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. Not only that, it will also be a violation of the Minsk agreements. So uh, uh, it will make it even harder to find a political solution based on the Minsk agreements. And, and NATO and I support the efforts of the, uh, in, within the Normandy format uh, of France and Germany um, uh, to find a political solution uh, within the Normandy format. And, uh, and of course, a recognition of uh, these two also territories as, uh, as some kind of independent uh, entities uh, will uh, totally undermine uh, these efforts and uh, violate the Minsk agreements. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. We will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much.